Thanks very much. Um, so I was charged as a NHGRI council member with describing the current uh, efforts in functional genomics and really with the focus on, on scale here. Um, there's a lot of functional genomics obviously going on throughout NIH and what can NHGRI bring to this. So just in terms of the broadest definition, and this is really the challenge I think in, I was thinking about in putting together th this talk uh, is that this area is re really huge in breadth, right? The functional genomics, um, this is what I came up with. I added genomes, right, because now we really want to understand entire genomes in, their, you know, in the context of uh, what the whole genome is doing in, the, in chromosomes, et cetera, in addition to the genes and gene networks and their regulation and how to understand the, how this regulation affects cellular function, development, and, and obviously disease. And so these are the kinds of points to think about during the talk, what are the challenges, and I'll raise a few of those, that, need, that can be solved and, and the needs that are, uh, that needs to be met relative to the function, understanding the functional role uh, of genomic variants in disease and, and health. You know, obviously NHGRI is, is only one of a number of ICs and uh, has a budget uh, that's limited in scope, so this has to be also kept in mind. Uh, and what, what would be the consequences of, of not having some functional genomics at scale at NHGRI? So, you know, when talking with staff, you know, about what their view of functional genomics within the context of the sequencing program, and there's a little asterisk here for a caveat, no, there's really no existing sequencing programs that are directly pursuing functional genomics at scale with the caveat that there's obviously sequencing itself at large scale, right, and identifying variants in interesting genes is going to allow, for example, associating variants with common disease pathways. A beautiful example of the schizophrenia consortium where, for example, voltage-gated calcium channels are associated and a number of other obvious genes that are associated with significance in that disease based on large numbers, 37,000 uh, individuals that were examined. And so only with this scale can you achieve the kind of power to begin to attempt to cluster and, and achieve some significance. So there's scale. But, of course, these are then associated with genes of known function, right? uh, And also, as you heard uh, uh, this morning all about the Mendelian centers, you know, this is genetics. I'm a geneticist. You say you're studying the functions of genes through genetics. And that, as you heard, can be scaled to some extent in terms of the, the numbers of Mendelian genes that exist and then the, the breadth of allelic variation within those and that these individual genes are each an achievement, an uh, interesting biology that comes out of them, but collectively they inform about uh, human biology, right? So there, there's a level of scale here, and you heard an argument for, for an ongoing um, centers. So NHGRI does have large-scale functional genomics programs that are connected with interpretation of variants. And some of them are ENCODE, and I'll, and I'll briefly mention some of the ENCODE work. Um, genomics of gene regulation, which maybe some of you haven't heard about because it's not yet funded, and also the functional variance program, which is also not yet funded. So ENCODE, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of, is really the idea is to generate a comprehensive catalog of all functional elements in the human genome. and the also util utilizing the genomes of selected model organisms because the importance of identifying these variants and most of the variants that, that come out of whole genome sequencing are not in protein coding genes. So associating the catalog of variants with the catalog of functional elements is going to be important for uh, assigning uh, those, those variants to uh, elements that could have function. And so this is just taken from a recent PNS paper uh, 
from the ENCODE group where it's a summary snapshot of the percentage of the genome that is covered by the different kinds of biochemical assays um, that are linked to the genome through particular elements. So transcripts, footprints, here's the percent, 100 percent. So some of these actually get quite large, and this has been debated in terms of the significance, and I don't want to get into an argument about what function is. These are biochemical activities that are associated with the genome that can be useful to inform about variant associations. And so here are uh, DNA's footprints, transcription factor binding sites. These are the things that you look at when you're trying to first uh, link a variant that's in a non-coding region. You go to the ENCODE data set and the roadmap uh, epigenomics data set, which I'm not going to discuss here, uh, and associate variants with, for example, histone marks or uh, these other annotations. So really we're decorating the genome with um, biochemical information that can then be associated with coding or non-coding variants. So genomics of gene regulation, just to briefly say it's not yet funded yet, um, the aim of this program, and this isn't really at scale in the sense of sequencing, for example, at the level of uh, the ENCODE project or, or the Roadmap Epigenomics project. This is more for understanding uh, gene networks, uh, largely focus on developing and validating models of gene regulatory networks uh, to try to uh, predict uh, the functions of uh, linking the different elements together to, into a regulatory network using, for example, RNA as an output, and really with a main goal of improving the current uh, methodologies for regulatory network um, models um, rather than incremental um, approaches. With the long-term goal, being able to look at sequence and accurately predict when and at what level a gene is expressed. That's a, a, a laudable goal. And, and in a particular cellular state, that's important. The genome sequence is, is except for a few tissues, the same. Uh, uh, and so trying to predict uh, from directly from the sequence is the goal. And functional variants um, also really can't be argued to be at scale. It's, uh, uh, but it's, these are tools that are going to be useful for understanding the variants as well. Um, uh, computational tools, they aim to develop highly innovative computational approaches for interpreting variants. And this is really an integration project, integration of data, um, phenotypes, patterns of variation uh, to identify and narrow. Uh, this is really to narrow, to focus on the set of variants that are likely to lead to disease states. So this is really to hone in uh, to where, which variants to prioritize on. And the accuracy in this program will be assessed by experiments. Right. And then the Common Fund uh, also has resources that have been um, uh, contributed for interpretation of variants. One is the, the, the epigenomics project, which has focused largely on uh, uh, analysis of tissues, so a tissue map, if you will, across uh, human um, biology, uh, looking at chromatin marks, hypersensitive uh, sites, et cetera, DNA methylation um, throughout the genome, and developing a, 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 a catalog in parallel, if you will, to the ENCODE project that's focused on tissues. There's also the GTEx project, which is a very large project to link genotype um, of individuals to gene expression patterns, to try and interpret um, the variants with gene expression, so QTL uh, at a large scale. Uh, the, the LINCS project is a sort of a, a mixture of different technologies, um, transcript analysis and perturbation, uh, metabolomic projects, proteomics projects, where a system, sort of an integrated systems approach to understand a network of genes and perturbation is the, is the goal there. Uh, and then there's a new project which was recently announced, which I think is quite exciting as part of the roadmap. It's the 4D Nucleome Project, the idea being to 
understand and I, uh, to develop technologies. There's a number of areas, imaging, um, molecular biology, um, and disease as well. But this program is to enable how DNA is arranged, the study of how the DNA is arranged within cells in space and time, and how dynamic uh, the changes are occurring within the nucleus, and to link these uh, features to uh, cellular states of in normal and disease states. And um, really the goal here is to, is, is, is multifold, but it's to develop uh, new technologies to be able to, and, and existing technologies can be applied to understand the DNA organization within the, the nucleus and its function. And so really you can put these, um, these kinds of uh, projects into two bins as f in terms of my thinking. One is resources for the interpretation of variants where you're associating um, genome-wide information of a variety of types with a genomic location to help inform about a particular uh, possible function of a variant. So that's what the ENCODE project is doing, that's what RoadMap project and some of these other projects are linking biochemistry to those regions of the genome to help interpret variants. The other is a, a functional sort of genomics approach where you're validating the variants directly by assaying function in some way, and I'll touch on both of these first starting with the variants. So again, from the recent ENCODE description of function, uh, the, the data can be organized in, a, in sort of a bull's, you know, in a bullseye fashion here in terms of the kinds of information that one can overlay. So genetic evidence from either mouse studies, from the Mendelian project, et cetera, from any, any genetic evidence about gene function can be overlaid with this sort of three-tiered of, uh, of, in terms of the uh, activity level data from the biochemical data from ENCODE, and that's linked with both the, the protein coding information and then the rest of the genome outside here. So there's a large fraction of the genome that has activity that is linked to DNA hypersensitivity, et cetera, that lies outside, obviously, of the protein coding region. And then overlaid on that is the ev evolutionary uh, evidence. And so this comes, again, from large-scale sequencing, comparative genomics, which will be one of the breakouts. And the question is, is this, continue, is this would continuing uh, uh, of this project be useful in terms of understanding more genomes in terms of their evolutionary consequences, even understanding uh, phenotypes from a variety of different um, model organisms, overlaying that information essentially to try to understand variant function. So you can look at it in this sort of silo approach here where this is a canonical gene and there are the, the SNPs. Um, these SNPs are associated here with gene expression, okay, so you can you can link the degree of association, for example, in an EQTL study from the GTEx data, let's say, to uh, those SNPs. You can also overlay the evolutionary, evolutionary conservation, and each one of these um, data are not complete because there are well-known regulatory uh, sequences that have very low evolutionary uh, conservation. Um, and there are also sites of biochemical activity that don't overlap with these, with these sites. So um, you can begin to overlay the, the, the sequence data from conservation uh, studies, uh, and these are still evolving in terms of being able to utilize uh, new, uh, new approaches for this. A variety of different types of assays for predicting TF motifs, um, uh, either biochemically in vitro or in vivo, um, linking those to, to DNA's hypersensitive sites, which themselves can identify footprints because they're high resolution, and ChIP-seq information, and a variety of other biochemical assays that then give you some probability, and this is what really needs to be, I think, a focus of confidence that a particular SNP is going to be a, a SNP to further evaluate in, let's say, a functional assay. In, in, as uh, Mike Snyder was, was discussing uh, the possibility. Okay, so let's look at the challenges. If you go back and look at this model, this is a very simplified example, right, where the SNPs are 
located next to something that is believed uh, to be the, the gene that those SNPs might be associated with, but that's not really the case. Regulatory elements act over a long range, and this makes it very challenging to identify their target. So here's an example of um, one particular gene where obesity-associated variants uh, are connected at a very long distance, okay, over 300 kilobases um, with a particular enhancer sequence in, that lies in another gene. So linking this information, we know that through biochemical experiments of a variety of types that looping occurs between enhancers and promoters and that these distances can be very great. So that really creates an enormous challenge for identifying genes with no obvious function. So calcium channels linked to schizophrenia, very good candidate. What if that was an unknown gene that had a high a SNP with a high uh, association? Uh, so we know that, the, that there are different layers. Uh, there's some beautiful recent work on uh, uh, using cryo-EM to look at these different levels of organization of chromosomes. The, the gap, and I think the opportunity, is right here. Uh, it, now, this is going on in a number of laboratories, but I think the scale is the issue to be addressed here. Is it worth scaling up the analysis of organization of enhancers and promoters and regulatory regions and SNPs um, to, at some scale? So I think there is an opportunity to explore these long-range interactions, carrying out genome-wide surveys right throughout a variety of cells. Uh, identifying the general features of chromatin organization and dynamics on a large scale, um, looking at local chromatin interactions in, in, between enhanced and promoters, and there's different technologies that I'll mention that you can do this, with really the goal of understanding um, the long-range regulatory element links to different genes, uh, with the goal here of understanding in the context of NHGRI the functions of SNP. So here's one assay that I think is really powerful, developed by Yope Decker and, and, and Eric Lander's group, and, uh, where you can essentially capture the information from domains that are, that are in cis or potentially in trans, but are at a long distance from one another uh, by capturing the association through this proximity ligation assay. So it was published here. I won't go through the details, but it allows you to associate large domains of interaction of proteins within the genome, and that's listed here by the different degrees of the heat map of the frequency, the higher frequency of interaction of domains that are closer and the relatively lower frequency of domains that are at a distant. And then through a number of studies in a number of laboratories, uh, domains have been mapped out, for example, topological domains that are so-called associated TAD domains, between which essentially represent these loops in the genome. Uh, but within these domains, you can also associate enhancers and promoters. And so for the study of, of, of enhancers, one can think of at least two approaches that are tractable, I think, and potentially could be scaled. One is the introduction of mutations into enhancers in their endogenous location to test for the expression of genes. This is a direct assay of the function of that enhancer on an associated gene. Uh, the con so far has been is this has been relatively apl applied at a relatively low throughput level, and if it's if it's going to be done in a in a model organism, maybe that SNP isn't necessarily um, going to be representative of an important one for human biology. The other approach is to to exploit the natural variation in SNPs between two alleles. It's a global approach, right? So if you find SNP variation and you can associate that with the expression of a gene, that requires that you have the haplotype of that, of that, um, of that genome. And so associating you know, allele A with gene A1 and allele 2 with enhancer with, with gene A2 and approaches are possible, again, using HiSeq in a method that was developed by Bing Ren's group and published this year, essentially of creating a, using HiSeq at a very high resolution to essentially make uh, haplotype um, linkage maps. Uh, 
And so this is an example, this is unpublished work from taking all the variants in the H1 ES uh, cell um, and then phasing those variants and then looking at the ratio of phase versus unphased variants. And I'll zoom in on a region from this. So essentially using haploseq, you can, you can phase both chromosomes and then begin to associate variation in enhancers with variation of uh, nearby genes. And, 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 and if there's information from the high seq you can have confidence that there's a particular enhancer promoter association. And so this is what some of the data looks like from those kinds of experiments where having that phased information, you can then link a variety of allele-specific information, transcripts, DNA methylation, chromatin marks of a variety of types. And this just shows one region where the, the, uh, the RNA expression data here, increased expression, is linked in phase with reduced DNA methylation, increased uh, marks of, of promoter uh, on these genes. Uh, and, and this can also be done at a very long distance, right? So you can then, this is an example of linking some of those alleles, so ES allele for mRNA, allele 1, allele 2, for methylation, uh, et cetera, to chromatin marks at a distance. And so this is a distance of 150 kb. So this can be used, this kind of data can be used to link promoters, SNP variants in enhancers um, through uh, uh, large-scale kinds of experiments, which really are going on in individual labs, but can they be really scaled? The other approach is a functional validation of variants. And so a variety of approaches have been developed um, um, in, in a number of laboratories um, uh, to take uh, particular, let's say, enhancer regions, carry out mutagenesis, or reorganize that information in a variety of ways, so mutagenesis, uh, and then uh, essentially synthesize those variants, and then introduce those variants into, into a variety of vectors, either transient vectors or integrating vectors, and then uh, either have readouts of sequencing at high throughput or fluorescence kinds of readouts to be able to understand at a very high level, that is a base a nucleotide level resolution, the information that that variant can potentially produce in terms of regulation of gene expression. So really a direct test in a high throughput way of, of the association of a variant with gene expression. Okay, and so this is a functional test that can be done at high throughput. And that kind of information, I think, will allow us to begin to understand um, when really scaled, the grammar of gene expression. So what does it mean to have a particular motif with a slight variant? And this is a challenge to have a slight variation in that motif on gene expression function okay, of that gene. Is it going to be functional? Uh, is a particular residue going to be functional or non-functional? And I don't think we have the data at a very high throughput in terms of uh, scale for this kind of information. And there are a variety of other assays and contexts that one can use to understand the grammar of gene expression. But probably the most powerful tool for understanding function is uh, through genome editing. Now I think here is a real opportunity for NHGRI and potentially this can be scaled. I know many laboratories are using these tools, including ours. Uh, but really bringing this to anal analysis of variants at a large scale, I think, hasn't really been done yet uh, in a way that I think NIHGRI can do it. And so although there are a variety of, of editing tools, such as Zinc Fingers or Talons, the Cas9 system uh, has, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system has really provided, I think, some opportunities that are unique. Uh, this system, first identified in, in bacteria, of uh, yogurt bacteria, essentially, uh, for, in terms of function, uh, is to uh, use a guide RNA to direct changes in the genome that can be, for example, as, as crude as uh, making a, an insertion and deletion by using a targeting sequence, a targeting RNA, to, particular, to a particular region of the genome to make an insertion or deletion. Uh, then in trans, you can add any sequence that you want and get through homologous re recombination, get a precise replacement of an edit. Um, you can use two of these 
uh, Cas9 uh, or two CRISPR RNAs uh, to direct the creation of large deletions or potentially rearrangements. And there are a number of other biochemical assays that I won't go into here that make this a really useful system, I believe, for large-scale editing. So one approach would be to validate, and I'll give an example here, of cis-regulatory elements. And I think, again, this, can be, this could be scaled. Uh, and here's an example from Bing Ren's laboratory. Um, an enhancer knockout uh, can, be direct, can provide direct evidence of the function of that element for gene regulation. And uh, you can test the effects on transcription, and you can test to see whether the effect is in cis or not by having that phased information. So you can have, if you have the, 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 the linking information plus the enhancer knockout, you can begin to link the, the, the loss of function or the editing function of that, um, uh, the edited uh, sequence. Uh, and its effect on the neighboring gene. And so here's an experiment that the Wren lab carried out. They did a wide cross, created F1 mice, produced ES cells, where, you, where they then uh, created a deletion of particular enhancer in a particular context. And so this just shows the scenario here where you would use two different um, targeting RNAs, uh, a single guide RNAs, that um, flank the enhancer. In this case, it's a large enhancer uh, of about uh, 12 KB, and these are the signals of the chromatin marks over that enhancer. Uh, and so this is the gene that is actually a very well-studied gene, SOX2, involved in reprogramming uh, of pluripotent cells. Uh, and Bing's group identified a signal suggestive of a enhancer that was distal to the SOX2 gene uh, and they were able to develop allele-specific probes for the two alleles of the, of the, the, um, the, the mouse um, genetic background so that they could analyze both the effect of the deletion uh, on the gene expression as well as on the cis regulatory element. And what they found was is that so they used that system to create uh, mutations in either both alleles or um, only the, 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 the 129 allele, the castaneous allele, and then they looked at individual ES clones, and so when they found that both enhancers were knocked out, they almost eliminated the function. When they, when they found, again, they were looking at um, allele-specific expression, if they looked at the 129, in the 129 deletion, it, the expression of only that allele was affected in cis, uh, and then you can have the opposite result where they deleted the, the, the castaneous uh, enhancer and it only affected in cis the castaneous um, uh, um, allele uh, for SOX2. So I think these kinds of experiments um, will, in addition to the, the sort of high throughput um, mutagenesis experiments or surveys of uh, nucleotide variation in a high throughput may really provide some powerful tools that I think that um, can be capitalized if they're, if they're scaled. Um, if there's a logic to being able to do these and uh, to analyze large numbers of variants. So these tools can also be applied in a variety of contexts. And the challenge here is, is that, you know, this obviously can be scaled. So synthesizing variants um, you know, on oligos cloning those in large, um, um, large scale through um, into various plasmas, creating lengthy viral libraries. This has been published in, by a number of laboratories. Uh, and then using uh, clever assays to as uh, assign function selection, either forward, positive, or negative selection, to really under try and understand what the variants are doing to gene expression uh, in, within different cellular contexts. So you can imagine, for example, in this case, taking a particular variant, introducing it into an ES cell, differentiating, so replacing that allele in its context in a system where you can understand uh, the, the variation on both alleles, so you have phase genome, <clears throat> and then reading out through different, so di differentiating those cells into, for example, neurons, and then looking at, at function in those cases. Uh, you can also do this in the mouse, it's been done by a number of laboratories. Rudolf Janisch has some beautiful work where he's replaced multiple alleles uh, in the mouse. And so this, in this case, you can also inject the protein uh, 
uh, and the guide RNA as well to be able to target specific genes and then look at the effect in, in development. Can also do in large scale in vivo experiments where lentiviral libraries can be injected into the tail vein to target different tissues. And this can be modified because there's, there's a whole other area of, 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 of biology that's being developed for targeting peptides to different organ, organs in the body. Some beautiful work uh, at Scripps uh, for doing this so one can potentially target other organs other than liver for assaying function. Okay, so I think there's a real opportunity for assessing the variants uh, in terms of a phenotype. Now these are molecular phenotypes, and earlier we heard about um, organismal phenotypes. Equally, they're important, I think, in understanding the functions of these uh, variants. And so um, I just point to one paper that I recently came out uh, from the uh, Ebert lab, which I think is a, a, pr a perfect example of this kind of uh, large-scale lentiviral screen where they identified five genes that result in a, 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 a myeloid malignancy model. And, that, and you, can, uh, you can extrapolate this to a variety of other um, disease models. Um, the last thing I'll mention is an example here, just briefly, is what I think is uh, my current favorite example of really beautiful work from the Kingsley lab in the challenge of understanding non-coding variants. And so there was a studies that were um, published a number of years ago identified a variant for hair color. Uh, this is one of about eight that are, add up to about 6% of the, very, explain about 6% of the, of the variation in blondness. And this is a population um, in Northern Europe that is, uh, has a high uh, law, law, uh, odds ratio for a particular allele, um, a, a to G allele. Uh, and this region that that SNP maps to, and so the Kingsley Lab looked at all the data. I think this is a perfect example. They looked at the conservation uh, using all of the uh, organism sequencing data and found that the SNP lies right in a region of high conservation. They carried out transgenic experiments with different um, regions, um, and this is likely to be, this gene is likely to be expressed in the follicles, and you can see that it is when you put that enhancer driving a LAG-Z promoter. They carried out both individual assays looking at SNPs where they've uh, included a SNP um, next to a reporter gene that is either the ancestral SNP or the blonde allele or a deletion allele, and they got a lot of variation. They were very clear about the fact that the deletion reduced this expression in the follicles, but the other alleles didn't have that consistent effect. They also used cell culture assays. They then used the data from ENCODE and linked a particular transcription factor left to a domain that right encompassed this SNP. Uh, they then went to the motif database and identified that this was a variant in the left motif. They then did transfection assays to show that that, that variant affected the expression of the kit gene. And then finally they did a transgenic experiment where they replaced that allele in a safe harbor context, not in the kit gene in the mouse, where they included both alleles and they could demonstrate that a 20% variation in kit expression w led to a change in the coat color of the mouse that was suggestive that this is in fact the allele that's causing the variation in people. Now, this study highlights why it's so difficult to identify causal variants for human traits. The SNP mapped more than 350 KB away from the kit gene. It acts in, a, in an anatomical site where the enhancer haven't been characterized yet by, for example, in code. There hasn't been uh, a survey yet of epidermal tissue. So the, there's, there's a lot more room for expansion of the catalog of regulatory elements in different tissues. Um, uh, the, the altered sequence doesn't perfectly match the left sequence. I didn't go into the details. And it only causes a 20% reduction uh, that reads to this phenotype. And it's only in a subset of the tissues that, are, that kit affects. It's because the loss of function of kit is lethal. And there are many other effects. So this is an enhancer that's tissue specific. But the study also illustrates how these difficulties can be overcome. The information from the population surveys allowed the identification of a variant that was uh, actionable in this case, or at least was suggestive that could be actionable linked to the region it was. 
the large-scale genomic uh, annotation projects provided the, 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 the underlying data for, for assigning, for linking to conservation biochemical activity. The transcription factor database allowed a hypothesis about a particular sequence. Uh, and the detailed functional tests of that enhancer in both cell lines and mice provided the, the biochemical or in, sort of data or genetic data that led to the pretty concrete finding that this is the, the causal variant of that variation. So I think that some of these kinds of assays that I've briefly discussed I think can be scaled and can be useful for un uh, understanding the function of these non-coding variants. And the breakout session this afternoon um, will touch on these various topics. I won't go through any of this. What is the, f you know, starting with what, what is really the function, at what level do you want to study phenotype? Is it, you know, at gene expression? Is it at the cellular level? Is it at the organ level, the organismal level? These are things that can be discussed. How do we interrelate function and variance on a large scale? And what are really the opportunities for NHGRI to be able to, to use these kind of approaches for uh, uh, leveraging the, the sequence variation that we now have. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. We have time for two, three, four questions. <laughs> Ewan. Just in case. Oh, well. Um, so this has, been, this has been very focused on the non-coding area, which is incredibly important, and we know that this is, um, you know, a lot, of G, a lot of stuff is happening in the non-coding area. I just wonder, are we, it, maybe this is f something for us to discuss in the breakouts, but there is this business of us really knowing the impact of every amino acid change. And, and, you know, the closer I've worked with people who are working in, in a clinical uh, with panels, gene panels and stuff like that, these variants of unknown function are really annoying. And um, uh, that's probably a British understatement. And, um, and getting a grip on those would be, would be quite important. Have you, have you thought about that? Yeah. Has, has anybody else I thought didn't about mean that? to exclude those. There, there are challenges. You know, when you look through the data um, from the complete genomes and you say, wow, this should be, Mike Snyder should be dead from looking at his genome. There's some, obviously, <laughs> There's some, obviously, there's some... We've got, we've got a counterfactual on that. <laughs> there's obviously some counter suppressor mutations, if you will, that are allowing those, those mutations that you expect have a devastating effect. So you could pick things out and say, hey, I'm going to try and understand this, but in absent all of the other variants in the genome, it's a complex genetic problem to try and understand the function of that variant. You see what I'm saying? I, I, I do. I just wonder whether we shouldn't be trying to think more systematically about the function of every amino acid change, because we know, uh, maybe even in even if you just restrict it in these panel genes, you know, genes the, yeah. the iron channel. Yeah, I, I, I think that's. Well. I think that's. I think that's a that's an important goal. It's just. I think it's just a little more complicated because you've got protein complexes that can be affected by variants, et cetera. So, so question over there. Me? I was just sharing the idea of iron channel gene binding. It's not working. Okay. So the, my question yep. actually is not about ion channels, but, but when you say do this on scale, how, how many variants do you think it's realistic to con conceive of studying? I mean, there are, there are what, 250,000 or 500,000 rare non-synonymous SNPs in the coding region, let alone the non-coding region. I mean, how many of those I, do you think it's realistic to even contemplate well, I think addressing? Th I think there have already been studies to examine thousands, hundreds yeah. of thousands of variants, at least at the level of adding those variants to a marker and putting them in, transfecting them into cells and getting a readout. I think these experiments can be scaled to it's look like at very game. large numbers of variants. I think it's like asking, how many genotypes can we collect in 1999, right? Could, do you think we could really do 10,000 at the same time, you know, today? Well, we if, if you look at the, you know, if you're thinking about the in vivo uh, model where, you know, you've, you're going to make mice, that may be a little bit more challenging. But making stem cells, yep. for example, that have variants, very large numbers of variants, and differentiating those to lineages that you believe that are important in those diseases, I think can be done on a large scale. Uh, so, yeah. 
David Altschuler, I, I want to connect a couple of the dots here. First of all, I want to go back to what Ewan said. I think that you interpreted his question to mean reduced penetrance and some sort of second sight suppressors. There is a very s straightforward idea, which is to say for genes for which we have, for example, a predictive assay already, for example, men many Mendelian disease genes or other genes, simply functionally testing all the variants found in very large samples, sorting them into which are functional, which are not, and going back and doing the genotype-phenotype correlation is now practical at scale and is a way around all this both variant of uncertain significance and reduced power. The second point is, my friend, who, uh, Jim Evans, who said, how do we translate all this stuff to drug discovery? We will continue to spend 50 or $60 billion a year on drug discovery, even if it's hard. And the key challenge in that, or a key challenge, is having an in vitro or cellular assay or molecular assay that is predictive of clinical response in a patient. Using genetics to try and connect the assay to the patient so the assay can then through chemistry being connected to the patient is a key challenge. And that's going to come through some sort of, you know, functional assays that are trained with genetics on the patient that they right. have I a didn't, higher rate of success. I didn't mean to, David, to leave out the, the drug part of it. In fact, Richard Gibbs on a phone call, you know, really pointed this out, that you could couple these assays, obviously, in stem cells in the right, even deriving the, you know, maybe the right tissue type to then test those in cellular assays with drugs and a readout. And, and let's not assume it's stem cells. Let's just say predictive yeah. assays. Yeah. Stem cells may be a way, means to right. that end, or Sorry. they may not. Sorry. Yeah. Joe, yeah, so just Carlos. to actually follow up on David and, and, and some of the points in your talk, um, one of the first things I'd, I'd like to point out is that um, the blonde hair story from Kingsley um, also illustrates that um, you know, digging into function may give you a different answer in different populations. So, you know, blonde hair in Melanesians is actually controlled by a totally different gene. It happens right. to be an amino acid change that also has a mouse phenotype. So, yes. you know, it, it illustrates why you can't just stop in one population and why you need to deal with both the amino acids yeah, and, and the function. Yeah, I failed to point that out, that this is only one, one way to get blondness. There are sure. much more. But, you know, but the same will be true for lots of the phenotypes that people are interested in, right? Um, I think the, um, the second point, which, which goes to David, is that, you know, doing the, uh, you know, every single amino acid change in the set of genes that folks are interested in, we could decide to prioritize that ACMG plus neonatal plus whatever um, may seem daunting today, but if we you know, decide to come together and do it, that's totally well, feasible I, I and think, doable, right? I think we and really so, need to, you know, if we look back and say, where would we be, you know, obviously we, we didn't think we'd be where we are now in terms of sequencing. I think the same thing can happen. These tools, some of these recent tools, really change the landscape for understanding functional genomes. And it should be done in an unbiased way, And they right? come at exactly the right time. And, and, and you know, we don't just need to focus on existing polymorphisms that are segregating in populations. In fact, one argument for going through and trying to do every site is that you sort of pre-compute it, and so you know even the patient that comes in with a mutation that you'd never seen before, you've already pre-computed it by doing the cellular assay. It's there. All right. It sounds like it's just about time to break for lunch. Um, it says here, setting the stage for the discussion. I think these four talks have set the, the stage for the discussion pretty well. Um, there are some threads that are easy to tie together that I heard. There are some that are harder for me to tie together. I'm hoping that we can do some of that in the discussion, if possible. Um, so if you could be back here at um, about an hour and five minutes, 1.15, um, that would be great. Thanks very much.